What is going on, Biz Dad Podcast? Thank you so very much for jumping in on uh, the very first podcast of the Biz Dad Podcast, um, the uh, the recording with my my father, Tim Labar. I am super excited to get this launched. Uh, uh, I just want you, I, I wanted to jump in and kind of say, hey, I, I apologize. Some of the audio is not the best in the world. Um, however, when, uh, and I'm, hopefully my dad listens to this because I'm going to make fun of him a little bit. When you're dealing with somebody who's um, retired and uh, um, could barely even open up the computer, let alone uh, get the get the right audio equipment, uh, I should have set him up for success a little better than I did. But, um, you know, we did everything we could to correct the audio to be as good as possible. Uh, but there's still some amazing content in there. I'm really excited about the launch. I'm really excited about the conversation I had with my father, and I look forward to uh, uh, to hearing some feedback on it. Um, uh, but just know, I do understand that some of the audio is not not the best in the world, but I'm still thrilled to launch it. There's no way I would would not launch this podcast with my dad. I mean, he uh, um, he means the world to me. I'm I'm super thrilled uh, to to share share with uh, with the world. You know, a, a good conversation I had with my dad. Um, so please enjoy the very first podcast. I I, uh, I look forward to some feedback. Um, I look forward to more of these getting released. I look forward to talking to more dads. If you're a dad out there that uh, uh, is also an entrepreneur, um, you know, please reach out to me. I'd love to have you on the podcast. I look forward to uh, to continuing this uh, these conversations. They're, they've been a lot of fun thus far, um, and I can't wait to to continue it forward. So, thank you so very much again for jumping on the very first podcast, and I look forward to uh, talking to every one of you later. All right. So welcome to the podcast, everybody. This is the very first podcast. And just so I want to do a quick introduction. My name is Adam Labar. I help run a couple different companies. I do various different things. And the purpose of this podcast is really just to chat about dads and entrepreneurship and kind of focus on tips, tools, tricks we use to teach our kids things that we learned as dads that help us as entrepreneurs, things we learned as entrepreneurs that help us as dads, how we kind of got onto the entrepreneur track and a little bit about that. So I figured it would be kind of fitting to bring my dad on for the very first podcast. So the first dad that I'm going to talk to is my own, kind of give a little bit of background on him, tell a little bit of stories about us and just kind of see where it goes. We don't really have a, a structure for the conversation we're going to have. It's just going to be me and my dad chatting. The reason that I'm a dad is because of my dad. So that it seemed to be pretty fitting to have him be the first person that I chat with on this. So a little bit about us. Well, first off, that's my dad, my dad, Tim. Say hi, dad. Uh, there he is. Like it or not, he's stuck with me. <laughs> so a little bit of background about us and dad, feel free to interrupt. If I go too fast over something, you want to say something, just let me know. Um, but a little bit of background about us. I was born as a military brat. My dad was Air Force. My mom was Air Force. My dad was in for what, 16 years before you broke your back? 14. 14 years? I, I broke it at 12 and then they okay. me out. But 14 years in the Air Force. And then after that, we bounced around a lot, even still up in upstate New York. Dad was finding different jobs and supporting the family in the best way he could where we were at and what was going on. And it was a lot of fun. I mean, it was one of those things where military members kind of realized this, but as a military brat, I still look back at it and go, okay, well, I have this memory. What house were we living in? Okay, we were living in this house. Okay, so that means it was this year. And that's how I remember where things were. It's just was it on Church Street? Was it yeah? Was it in Pennyville yeah. or was it yeah. North Dakota? You never know. So I don't remember North Dakota at all, other than going back to visit. But you know, that was kind of dad ended up becoming a correction officer in New York. And then we finally got to settle down for my last few years in school. Um, so I graduated in central New York and off to the military I went. So it was a big mess of moving around and figuring things out and bouncing here and bouncing there, finding new friends, going over here to learn more about these friends. And it just, I mean, that's kind of the life I've known now forever. Military brat, now turned military. And after almost two decades of doing the military thing, that's... You're getting ready to move. <laughs> there I go, move it again, right? Uh, else. Why not? Because why not? So that was an awesome trip. I learned a ridiculous amount, Dad, from you that I didn't realize I learned until much later in life, right? So I forgot who it was that talks about it, like the path that you go with your dad that I'm going to butcher this and I don't remember exactly what it is, but it's basically like you idolize your dad and then you despise your dad and then you accept your dad. And then there's one more stage there that's basically like you become your dad or you like these different stages that you have with your father, right? It took some time for me, especially like once I joined the military and to really realize what you are actually doing for us or what you did for us in the ways that you knew how. And we chatted a little bit before this that you didn't have exactly the best example for somebody to follow as a dad. 
And so that once I learned more about that, it shines such a light on who you were and how you became who you were. That it was like a smack in the face to me, like you ignorant idiot. You had no idea what your father ever went through to get to the point where he is now to get you, Adam, to the point where you're able to be a dad to a couple boys and start businesses and do all the stuff. Like, had you not made a shift from what you saw, there's no way that I would be where I'm at. So because typically we'll get into it a little bit, but typically somebody who comes from a background like yours just goes down, it, it tends to go down the same path of abuse and all that type of stuff. But I want to turn it over to you to kind of tell a little bit of story about yourself, however it is you want to do an introduction and we can continue to chat. Adam, you hit quite a bit of the history without the gory details. Yeah, I never grew up with a dad. I didn't know what it meant to love a dad. Mine died before I was a year old. And then three years later, stepfather came in and there was eight of us. So I was the youngest of five boys. And virtually all five of them, and you know, just like everybody else in the family, they all took pretty bad turns. When I joined the Air Force, like you, I was awakening. I said, there is a life. I mean, I joined the Air Force to get away from home. I mowed lawns as a kid to get away from home. I milked cows and worked at a drive-in to stay away from home because there was no good leading examples. I knew the Air Force would fix that. Combine that with Ronald Reagan two years after I enlisted, it just set my moral compass in a way that my brothers and my sisters never had a clue that I was even availed to. I mean, my mother called, my brother called your grandmother when I was working down at Sing Sing. Uh, my first year as a correction officer. And he said, oh, yeah, what did Tim do? What did he do down there? He was convinced I had committed a felony. Of course. He was in disbelief that I was a bad correction officer. And, you know, it's, it, it, I didn't know really if I was going to be a great dad, a good dad, an average dad. I can't compare myself to any other because I know none. I just went along the way, made mistakes. Mom was there to help keep my moral compass, my temper down because of the Air Force stress. And then it's fivefold in prison. So I knew that I come off a little hot sometimes, but I think the moral compass was fairly tame compared to my peers or my family. Yeah. So I wanted, you know, what all dads want, not stepfathers, of course, but all dads want what's best for the kids and have the kids do better than you. And generationally, you guys have done, all three of you and your, both your sisters, kudos to Sarah and Monique, you guys all done very well. And as a dad, with a lot of help from mom, we pulled it off. And mm. it was very difficult. Mm. I, I left. It was a lot easier. And I I the dad thinks, I mean, I never played ball with my old man. I never played golf with my old man. We did nothing together other than occasional ass whooping. <laughs> but he was an authoritative disciplinarian, and that's why all my brothers bailed as soon as they could. And as soon as I could, I bailed. You know, if you're in a hole and you think you're in a hole and you're watching this, guess what? You can get out. With faith in God and faith in your family, not necessarily stepdads, but your family, all of them, down and we're up. Yeah. You know, you can get some good advice from your kids, and it's nice to see that your kids have taken some of your advice. So, yeah, it, that's pretty much how it was. I mean, I did a career in the Air Force, got hurt. They found a way to put me out. A year later, I was enjoying a really good job, and they shut down and working for your Uncle Joe. And then all of a sudden, Monique was sick, may have needed a kidney, and needed a real job. Applied for troopers and corrections and NCON all over New York, you know, good government medical jobs directions called first there you go 26 years later i'm retired living in florida loving life just happy as i've ever been in life right now you and i tell that to people all the time like i've never seen you with this length of happiness like i mean i've seen you happy like when my oldest was born right it was the first easiest time for me to say i really remember seeing you happy right I mean, I've seen you happy before. I mean, your first hole in one that you got while like on my trip home before I went to Iraq back in 06, you know, to see, well, there you go. See, uh, so that, that yeah, he told me that he brought props. He actually, before I hit the record button, he had said, oh, no, I thought of another one. I got to go get one more prop. So he goes and runs and gets one more prop. But so, I mean, the very first hole in one, extreme excitement, but again, short, short lived. Right. And not that your excitement about being a grandpa to your son's son 
was um, short lived, but it's not like you lived with me, like you were there, you were visiting, and then you went back to work and do your thing, you know? So, but now I spent a week down there with you guys at one point, but I'm like, you were never upset. You were so happy, just like go out on a golf course all the time, just enjoying life, having a good time. You know, it's your voice. <laughs> all the stuff that would entailed with work, whether it was Air Force and the pressures of that or prison and convicts and the power, mm. all that's gone. You know, it's so much easier with all that flushed out of your head. I mean, I'm losing weight. I'm feeling good. I've been very healthy. And you are right. No, I'm noticeably more happy now. Oh, yeah. Without all the strings attached to all the stuff that been pulled. I mean, you're wearing a shirt with flamingos and stuff on it. You would have never worn that. Before. <laughs> I'm very confident, man. Very happy. And this was always a lifelong dream. But as a public servant, you know the deal. Mm -hmm. You just, you never can really rely on that dream coming true. Yeah. And here I am living the dream, living on a golf course, living in a very safe community for the wife, her mom. Yeah. And knowing that all I got to do is just jump in the cart and in 30 seconds, we're at the club or the pool. Yeah. Or the golf course. Yeah. And we never really have to leave here except to go shop. Yeah. It's great here, which is awesome, which is exciting for me to be able to watch. Because if for no other reason, then I get to go and play golf with you all the time because you're always free. So uh, <laughs> always honored, and I'm honored to go fetch and do jobs for you, too. <laughs> yeah, as you did the other day for my Airbnb. So I, I talked to a lot of people about we have wireframes and I chatted with you, Dad, a little bit before this, like that we have wireframes that we see, right? There's this book that I absolutely love and I've read it probably three, four times now. It's called The Secrets of the Millionaire Mind. And it kind of talks about the thoughts we have about money and where we get them from. And nine times out of 10, like it comes from what we saw our parents do. And you just kind of continue to follow down that trend. And so we kind of build our own wireframe and the wireframe analogy is not part of that book. It's something else, but we have our little wireframe built in finances, in fatherhood, in life, in golf, in everything. Right. So thoughts, yep. all of our thoughts go to, and then if, when we experience something in life, we apply it back to that wireframe so we can analyze what happens based off our previous experience, based off the thing we have built. And then we, we act according to that thought process. You know, it's one of the reasons that like the military you and law enforcement, you're always training, training, training. You don't bend over to pick up the magazines. You don't do all these things because you want to build the wireframe in there that once I get rid of that magazine, it's empty, it's worthless, it's garbage, I need to put a new one in. I don't need to worry about picking that up. I don't need to worry about bending over to pick up brass. There was a study of like law enforcement officers were getting shot and killed. Um, this is a long time ago. We're getting shot and killed in the line of duty when they still had rounds in their gun and they just weren't shooting back and they were trying to figure out what was going on. And what was happening is they were going back to the training that they were receiving, right? So they're on the range and they'd go and shoot and then they'd pick up round, empty shells and put them in their pocket. And they would find these empty shells in the pockets of these law enforcement officers who were killed in the line of duty. So they were still in the middle of a firefight going back to that training. So they had their wireframe built on how they were going to do it. And until something comes and changes and shatters that wireframe, pushes it and says, no, you need a new one, you tend to go down that same track. So you never really had a wireframe of a dad because you never really had a dad, right? So, you know, you kind of had to figure it out. And for me, I didn't realize the wireframe I was giving, given until much later where I realized, oh, now I understand why my dad did what he did. I understand why he was the way he was, like learning more about you and your life and experiences that you had tell, told me, wow. So the reason that he may have had two jobs and then went out at night to go do X, Y, or Z, you know, go over to Scott's house to go play cards. Like you were supporting your family, doing everything you could bring it in two paychecks needed some time to, you know, settle down and get away and just kind of like, Hey, I, I like uh, you have to have those things. And then seeing that everything you did was always to support the family and always to help take care of the family in the best way you knew how at that time, because you had no example to do it, right? So for me, I started to try to apply that in my life and try to say, okay, well, whatever I'm doing, it needs to be to support my family in the best way possible. I need to be the best dad I can be in everything that I'm doing. Um, it's one of the reasons I left the military. Like, it's not because the military life isn't good. Like, they help, they take care of you. They do good things that, you know, I was able to start my investing career. I had a couple hundred doors of multifamily before I left the military. I was able to do these things, but I had to do a lot of reset. And when we were in Japan, for example, we went, Constantly, I was gone, like on my going away, I think, you know, it's back on, on the shelf or something somewhere, right? It says, Adam, always TDY, which stands for temporary duty. It's somewhere where you're traveling somewhere, always TDY Labar, right? And then it said, thanks for visiting on it because I was gone all the time, right? So by going away, it said, thanks for visiting because it was like I was just temporarily there at that base. One of the times, 
Adam came running up to me, Adam, the oldest, he comes running up to me and says, daddy, 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 don't leave again. And all I was doing was taking the trash out. And at that point I said, something's got to change because if I'm going to go on another trip, it's going to be because it's going to improve my family. Not because somebody somewhere at some seat said, I need you to go somewhere, right? Hey, here, you need to go to Thailand for four months. You need to go to Afghanistan for seven months. You need to like, it needed to be for a legit reason that was to better my family. And then, you know, just to go back to what you like, that's exactly what you did with joining corrections. You could have probably done a billion different other jobs, but you said, okay, Monique, who, by the way, if anybody's going to get something crazy, it's going to be Monique. Like, I don't, like, it's constant. So she's always a problem. So she gets some crazy disease. And like you said, okay, I'm going to figure out how the best support this. And you said, okay, these jobs right here are going to be the best way for me to be able to do it. I'm going to take the first one that we get to be able to support her. Boom. Got it. Corrections 26 years later. Here we are, right? So that stuck out to me. Like, these are the things I need. You guys may not remember. We were taking Monique to uh, Vermont. Oh, yeah. A job in corrections. And I had bills in Vermont when I took the job in the department. And my fourth week in the academy, I had to go down and see the watch commander. And the guy walking me down said, nobody survives this walk. You must have screwed up this weekend. He said, I don't drink. I don't do nothing. Give me nothing. Granted, I was out in the Gwanda, way on the western side of New York, and I live way on the eastern side. So we go down this hallway, and I see the watch commander report and do all this stuff. He gives me an envelope. got a sign for it. I said, I'm getting certified mail here. Is this how you fire people? So I opened it up, and it was a letter from the Department of Correction. They're going to cover all of Monique's bills. From Vermont. So instantly, these guys... I'm in the academy. Didn't even make out of the academy. The bills are paid. Yeah. That's why I put as much as I did into the department. I mean, I've been yeah. union steward. I ate the two years I had to spend in Sing Sing, and that's no, that's a war zone. It literally is a war zone. Long before I got there, and it still is today. Yeah. It's where they teach all of new guys. If you can cut it there, you can cut it anywhere, including Attica or Clinton, where I'm from. So you guys may or may not have known about that, but that was the sole purpose. When they paid that bill, I became an A student. So you, got mm-hmm. you got me. You, you taking care of me where I needed it most. Yeah. And I couldn't get none of that in my family. They were broker than I was. Yeah. I think I've worked more years than any of those, my brothers and sisters, in their lifetime. I'm sure. Because I've never not worked. Mm-hmm. I've always worked since I was like 10. It's just been... At first, a life to get away from my dad, away from the house, learn something from somebody. And uh, I guess one of the best dad influences was Alan Henry. I don't know if you ever got to meet him. I don't know the name. He was the owner of the Border Drive where I work. It was right up the road. He was the biggest guiding adult in my life growing up with half a brain. And I mean, he treated me like a son. I was, I spent the night at his house. I babysat his daughter. I went to Montreal hockey games with him. He treated me like a son. And he was kind of bummed when I joined the Air Force. I said, you knew it was my dream. I mean, I had an early enlistment. I was supposed to go in in June. He called my recruiter, got it pushed on a tope. Because <laughs> he didn't want to let me go until after the, the driving season was over. That's funny. But the military, like you said, all that moving around, even in corrections, it gave me influences from a lot of other people. Mm-hmm. A lot of people don't realize how many cultures we're exposed to in the military. I, I try to explain to the guys I golf with down here, the guys I work with at Mid State and Corrections. These guys, they never left home until they had to go to the academy. Yeah. You know, and then they, they're back home. They never left New York State. When I told them what kind of a family I have, they said, What? I said, We grew up with not blinders, we grew up with eyes wide open. We've met every culture just about you can imagine. In Plattsburgh was our first experience with a Filipino wife to a giant. (laughs) Yeah. This is great. And then that exposure is something that my family would never want. That's disgusting. Like go to Japan, eat (laughs) anything they put on the plate. We ate a lot. You tried a lot of things. I was impressed. I tried everything. So it's that too. It's cultural. I never had a culture. I mean, my family was all in the family. Back then, they didn't call it racist, but they were outright racist. Mm-hmm. 
I think my dad, my stepfather would roll over in his grave if he looked at you know my children, his <laughs> grandchildren's spouses. And yeah. those that are listening, I have a very black son-in-law, a first generation Cuban American daughter-in-law, and another son-in-law that's white as rice. How more blended can you get than them three? <laughs> yep. And I love them all. I love their family and their family, you know, it's that moral compass. We're all basically in the same, we all believe in God. And, you know, that's grounded everybody's moral compass in the roots of this family. And it never existed outside the Catholic Church. You know, they go to church. On- Which I'm beginning to wonder about their moral compass right now. But that's a different story. <laughs> <laughs> they're exposed to the stuff that you see in the news. We had a you know, very good church. But, man, when they started changing the rules, they said, this ain't right. Yeah. So, 17, I found a different path. And then the Air Force just. Ooh, it opened all of that. And I'm an Air Force dad. I mean, I have a little sign that my sister made. They have, you know, we go where the Air Force sends us. All that traveling made me a different dad because I learned how different cultures treat their kids. Ooh, exposure to everything. I mean, you've been in the desert. You've been in the mountains. You've been down here in sunny Florida and Japan. It's all stuff that has made you a better dad, too. And I'm kind of tickled that it's taken you over almost 40 years to figure out how tough it is to be a dad and then reflect on what I may or may not have done. Yeah. I just hope I didn't do too many things in anger because you can't take that back. Yeah. I remember one thing in particular on a golf course that made me sick for three days, but I'll never break another club. <laughs> I've never broken in my life. Yeah. I never forgot that because what kind of an example am I setting as a dad? With another dad time where he's pounding down the beers like it's water on a hot day with his two sons. I see the example he's making. I just made an error. <laughs> and I fixed it and never did it again. I don't think I've ever lost my temper on the golf course since. I, I broke one club over my knee after I came back from Afghanistan. And that was the only time I ever broke a club. And it was one of those, you know, hey, just coming back from a deployment, there was a lot going on in my brain, a lot happening in life. And uh, I, it just, you know, everything compiling in one spot to go back to a dad example. Right. So I had Adam sitting on my knee once and I was talking with him about something and he kept playing with a toy and, um, I grabbed the toy and I threw it across the room. And then I had to look at him and I said, buddy, I am so sorry because that was a terrible example. I should have just taken it, set it aside and explained to you why we shouldn't have done this. And he was like four, maybe five at the time. Right. So, um, Definitely not five. He was four because this was in Japan. That, that was one of the things I said. I told myself, you just reacted in anger and you're teaching your son to react in anger. And that's the wrong way to do it. Because here I am trying to tell a kid. So one of the things I started doing was probably before that. I just didn't use the trigger this time. Is I'd always look at him and I said, what, what are you like a two-year-old or something? What are you a four-year-old or something? What are you seven? You know, because it trips something in my brain to remind me, your kid's seven, your kid's three, your kid's two. Like, there's, it's okay. You're not, you're, this isn't the end of the world. We're just working through these things. You know, it's just as much as a, an icebreaker to kind of say like, okay, let's tone the situation down a little bit. Remind me that this is not a big deal. It's okay. We can get through this and, and press on. So no, I don't think I ever remember anything terribly. So I'd say that the time you came home and heard that I had punched my sister in the face, that was, you were, you were pretty upset. And then you went and sewed. So that's been like a joke forever in the family. Like if dad gets really upset, he's going to start sewing. So if we ever see him sewing, stay away. We know he's angry, right? I started, I sewed a lot in the military that just, I'm good at. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever excuse you want to give the listeners, dad. Yeah. We know that when you get angry, you're going to start sewing. So I don't know if you ever heard the other half of the story. You probably did eventually by now. But the reason that I had punched Sarah in the face is because they threw me down the stairs in a sleeping bag. And I was angry. So I came up and hit Sarah after she threw me down the stairs. And I've never been told that. Oh, really? Yeah, that's that's how it all happened. Told that your son get his sister. Yeah. And we had a basically a come to Jesus meeting about. Yes, we did. Women, and yeah. it's never been a subject since. Uh, it never needs to be. Right. So I have to strike you like my old man. That was my old man. Yeah. Go back, get me a stick. Go get my belt. We just had a close-up conversation, and we're both better dad for it. Oh, yeah, for sure. Because if you can only think of once, you know, I could think of a few other times that I thought I got harsh on you, but... Well, there's a difference between being harsh and being, especially 
looking back now with, with a new set of eyes, right? I'm sure in the moments there were times where I was like, my dad's a jerk and I don't like it, or he doesn't like me and blah, blah, blah. There's always those moments that kids are going to have, right? But looking back at it now and go, well, I have gotten to the point where I pretty much just go, from where you came from, you turned out so phenomenally well. <laughs> like you're on the correct side of the bars. You've never gone to jail. Um, I remember what, you, watching you get arrested once, but that's a different story. We were waiting for you to pick us up at the YMCA and you got arrested on the road. But uh, that was just a snafu and some paperwork. But yes, well, it was a paperwork snafu um, for the most part. But uh, I don't remember where I was going with that. I forgot now. Yeah, whatever. So I tend to look at all of our situations now and go, well, there's no situation I can think of that I go, I'm upset at my dad for doing this or anything like just none of that ever comes to my brain anymore. And I want to make sure that my kids think that same thing where, you know, I'm teaching them. And you, you mentioned it earlier, one thing I've been telling my boys since they were born basically is my job is to teach them to be better men than me. So if I can teach them to be better men than me, then I've succeeded. And it got to, it was one time I told Adam that, and he says, daddy, I don't want to be a better man than you. He starts crying. Right. And I'm like, no, buddy, this is a good thing. Every dad wants their kids to be better than them. Right. So it's just what we want, right. We want our kids to be better. And that's kind of the purpose of this whole podcast. Anyways, like I became an entrepreneur semi-accidentally, right. I mean, I had kind of fell into this real estate thing after getting married to Raquel, you know, I had my previous wireframe. I mean, I had from the first to the 15th to spend my paycheck because every first and every 15th, the government would give me a paycheck. So that meant I had those 15 days to spend my paycheck because the next one was coming in. So I would do that every single paycheck. Just, you know, I lived paycheck to paycheck without the stress of a bunch of debt and everything. I never really got into debt. I'd have a $4,000 car loan or something like that, but that was about it. I mean, my first, my second motorcycle I bought in cash after coming back from a deployment, really smart use of money, just so everybody knows. Uh, <laughs> but that's what, you know, military members do. They go and buy a, for the most part, right, um, is they buy that Corvette when they come back for deployment or they buy a motorcycle or they do something stupid. They spend a bunch of money on something, right, because that's it's what we do. You know, it just cycles, that's why. Yeah, so here we go. I'm going to buy my second one because I totaled my first one, you know. And, and what does your son drive? He's got his. He's out there on his dirt bike just all the time, you know, which now we got to give that dirt bike to my youngest because that's like you should see Adam on the dirt bike now. Like his knees are up real high and you're like, oh. What did you grow out of this thing? Like, what are we doing? I got to buy you another one now. So, um, uh, oh, definitely don't need one uh, 125 yet. Maybe we'll go to an 80 and we'll <laughs> go through there. I got married and uh, Raquel had this thing that I had never really, I'd heard of these things, but this thing called a savings account. I had never seen one. I had to, like, I had, I think, $15 in mine, which was just like the minimum amount to keep it open. Uh, and that's it. I never thought, so I said, why, why did you do this? And then her wireframe comes from being like, as you mentioned, a first generation Cuban American, right? So like, we're going to hoard everything we have, because we don't know what what's going to change, we don't know what's going to happen. And not that it was taught to do that, you just saw it, like, because that's what, you know, you never taught me, um, Adam, you should, you know, spend your money on these fun things and do these things, you know, you just like, we wait for the paycheck, the next paycheck to come, that's just what we do, you know, and it just takes some time, and then you retire, so you can get your pension, and then you go do another one. And then, you know, that's just, what you do. So I learned about this thing called a savings account. And then Raquel said that, Hey, we should look at real estate because her mom owned a house. Um, her grandma owned a couple houses. Said, Hey, why don't you look at real estate? So I laughed at her and went and lost money in the stock market because I thought the stock market was going to be a much better idea than real estate. Um, so I went and lost a relatively at that time, relatively large amount of money in the stock market. And I said, honey, what was that you said about uh, real estate? <laughs> So I go back to her and she's like, no, really, you should look at real estate. So I did a bunch of research, started to look at all this stuff. And because what I, another trigger that happened in my brain is I said, well, if she's doing this, she's saving money. And, you know, the Bible tells me that I'm supposed to be the leader of this house. I'm going to do a pretty poor job if I don't figure out how to manage finances better than I am. So I started to ask her some questions. I started to research as much as I could. And I'm a researcher anyways. I dig into things constantly. I'm that guy at Walmart. Like, okay, I can't decide between this and this. I'm looking at all the reviews, checking all the specs, looking at all the things, making sure what's that. And then before you know it, I'm like, I'll figure it out tomorrow. I'm going to go home and do a little bit more research. Like, it's just what I do, right? So I started digging in more and more about all of this stuff. And now, like I mentioned at the beginning of our chat, is I mean, I've had a, a few hundred different doors of multifamily. I've started a reggae fund. I've helped run an education company that teaches military members and veterans how to invest in real estate, that I do coaching. I mean, I do all this stuff now that I would have never, ever, ever thought I would be doing. 
And I want to be able to pass this stuff on to my kids. So one of the, again, another impetus to this podcast, something that, that a catalyst to get me going was I was talking to another guy. I'm in another thing called GoBundance, another mastermind called GoBundance. And one of the guys I was chatting with there, um, he had told me that he bought his kids a house, each one of their kids a house. And he teaches them how to manage them and like, hey, well, will you have a tenant in? And the, this is the money that came in for this month. And these are the bills we have. And they go through all these things. And I went, that is genius. I need to do that for my kids. Like I need to teach them how to do this. So that's when I went, if this is going to help me, then I might as well, well, let me see if I can have more of these conversations and get people on that can chat about the, how they use their entrepreneur skills to help their family and their kids. So I've already talked to Adam multiple times and we've sat down and he's ready to invest a hundred dollars into the house that we buy him. So, you know, we're in the, literally in the process of looking for a house for him um, and for us because you know, we're getting ready to move again. Um, so, you know, trying to find something for him to be able to invest in and teach him how to do all of this. And it just, you know, it's so much fun to kind of, I don't remember where I was on some call somewhere, some podcast or something. And I was talking about how our kids are kind of like, kind of like little businesses because it was, a, it was a bunch of business folks we were talking to. Like each one of our kids are kind of like a little business. Like we want to be able to get to the point where we're basically board members, where they can come back and ask us questions if they need to, but we don't really want to be the CEO anymore. Like once they're 18, we don't want to be the CEO of this business anymore. Like right now I'm the CEO of these two little businesses and I want to get these businesses to the point where they can uh, be extremely successful. They're pushing themselves along. All the systems are in place for them to just kind of be a wind up doll and go. And that way, when they turn 18, I could turn into a board member where if they ever need a call on the board to ask questions or work through difficult things, they can, but I don't need to be actively involved in the business anymore. So that's kind of the way like, and that's what I want to do for the kids and teach them the same thing, same values, you know? So my little kid businesses that I've got running around out there. So, um, yeah. Little lumps of clay. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it's the way I looked at you guys. Yeah. So we just try not to have to, because these clumps, you can't just smush back down and start over. You know, that's, <laughs> you've got to work with what you've done. <laughs> Once that moving starts, you got to hope that most of it takes, if 10% <laughs> takes, well, both of us are looking there. You know, mm -hmm. mom, she grew up, you know, younger, so how many? <laughs> 12. And she's number 12. So she had a large. So your mom helped me to mold it to a good dad too. And she reminded me from time to time of my responsibility. Yeah, I think that's what a, a good wife is going to do and a good mom is going to do is will you keep each other on track and doing the right things and making sure, hey, like if you're honest with each other, helping each other kind of, hey, you screwed this up or you did, or, you know, like um, once in a while, do a... Well, maybe that route shouldn't have been taken. Yeah, yeah. And then let's think about that before we do that again. Yes. I mean, whether it's going to get a credit card, it could be something that simple. Mm -hmm. But the influence of dads, you know, you and I, we generally get the final say as dads, but I sometimes bow down to the needs of mom as well. Yeah. And the wife as well. You know, they used to say, you know, a happy wife is a happy life. No, yeah. A spouse is a happy house. You know, and this is, a very happy, way, way better than I expected. Oh, for sure. Way better than the families I was exposed to, my family, how any of their retirements worked out. You know, more than two years now, next week, I've been retired. Yay. I never expected it. At least 24 months ago, gone. Yeah. Just gone. And I'm kind of sort of a selfish, not with the family, but with the my friends in different states and, and between the military and the, I've been selfish with my family and me down here. I think that's why I'm happy. And dads need to do that once in a while. Just don't spend so much time with so many people that you got so many feelers out there that you, you've taken time away from your kids or your spouse. Your wife. Yeah. And I'm not going to say significant other because it's not or hard me. Yeah, of course. I don't know who is this going to be exposed to. <laughs> who cares? I mean, the, the best part about these things is, you know, like I told you at the beginning, like we don't have really any structure. And as long as I'm myself, I figure that's going to be the best route. Yeah. And if somebody doesn't like it, you guys can unsubscribe already before you even subscribe. So <laughs> I don't really care one way or another. So, yeah. I mean, I, I kind of respect the woke community, but I'll never be a woke guy. Where I grew up, I mean, they're just out there labeling people to label people. Yeah. 
And what the wife, they ran out of the White House yesterday. This woman speaking for the president said men can get pregnant and they can get raped. She said, of course they can. Well, I mean, men can get raped, yes, but they certainly can't get pregnant. <laughs> they can get pregnant and have abortions, not the rape. Mm -hmm. Yes, of course. And uh, they came back to the Republican side and said, yeah, show us the study that says that. <laughs> you know, like this it battles my mind. But, Let's get off of politics. And yeah. So that, you know, but that tells me that, I mean, that's another thing for me is like, I grew up in public school and Raquel grew up in private school. So when it came time to how do we want to raise the kids, I always thought that my public school experiences set me up well for going in the military. I was a little bit more eyes open on things. Like I had already been to parties where the cops had come in and busted in. I'd been to like, I'd seen people getting hammered. I'd seen people like have drugs and seen all, all the stuff. Like, so there was nothing that was new under the sun at that point. I mean, obviously, there's still a ton new under the sun, but I, I joined the military and I felt like, okay, I'm so much more prepared. And then I looked at Raquel and she was in her private school and, you know, not as exposed to any of that stuff. And I always thought, man, I think that I want my kids to go to public school because I want them to kind of have that. And then once I actually had kids and we started talking, I was like, mm, I don't really know. <laughs> so, you know, and especially now I look at the schools and I'm like, there's no way. It's either private school, Christian private school, or homeschool. Those are my two options at this point. I, I don't want to play around with any of the other options. So that's, you know, it, the politics help, like are going to change your parenting regardless. Like that's just how you have to do it because you're going to be, you know, whether teaching, hey, this is how we act as men, this is how you should be acting as a productive member of society, or this is how you should not be acting as a productive member of society. This, this is not mostly peaceful. This is like, like these, these are things that we, you know, we teach our kids and they see what's going on in the world. You might as well have a conversation about it. And raise your kids to be, you know, raise my boys to be better men than me. You know, that's the only way I can do that is to expose them, control the exposure as best I can. Um, you know, know that they're going to be their own person and they're going to do their own things at some point. And I'm going to be disappointed in certain things that happen. And they're going to be disappointed in me in certain things that happen. But, you know, fail forward, fail often, fail forward is, you know, what I try to do, you know. You do something that I was never exposed to as a kid is you take the time to teach give the opportunity for them to learn. This is why you don't do this. Uh, this is why we're doing this as a family. Never had any of that. And I've seen mm -hmm. it many times. You're way better at it than I ever was. And it took me a little while to catch on, you know, to figure it all out. But as a teaching dad, you're very good at it. And it reflects in your kids. And they're teeny weeny. Yeah. But they have respect for themselves and others. Whereas I didn't grow up with any of that. Yeah. To get back to molding me as a father, the combination of having a daughter, uh, the politically, you know, I was scared to death. Do I really want a kid? We had hostages in Iran at the time. And we were very nearly going to war. We had Carter as president, gas lines. I mean, life was tough back then, just like it is now. How do you grasp it all? And now you're going to bring a kid into the world. When Ronald Reagan became president, it was the opposite. Not necessarily that I was really heavy into politics, but I learned, he said, pick a course. You know, you got to pick a path. And the Air Force a year later came down with, uh, I forget what the quality of life, or, or, there was a name for it. We used, used to be able to get a DWI in the Air Force and still keep your job, not get busted, just get yelled at. Smoking dope with all the Vietnam vets that I was exposed to, it was no big deal. Uh, quality force. That's what it was. Reagan brought that in in 81. And it weeded out a lot of the guys that I kind of worked with in life. Wait a minute. These guys were all drunks and drugging. No, no, that's not the path I wanted. Yeah. I always refer to Reagan a lot. He took away all the evils that I was exposed to, and, but didn't realize they were evils because I was exposed to them growing up. Yeah. And you guys never had to worry about that. That was, And that's a huge evil because it's so tempting. I mean, alcoholism ran true through my entire family. Everybody yeah. in my family was a bartender. Like, ooh, 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 I'm going to be a bartender. But it was <laughs> six days a week, you don't pay, pay for it. I didn't want that. It was in a dark room. I want of course. To be different. So between the military exposure to the world and then corrections exposure to real life, because I brought some of the stories home. Mm -hmm. Not a lot of them, you guys. I try to keep it humorous, but all that makes dads. So that's why I kind of sort of brought politics in a little bit. You can learn a lot what's going on right now today. Is uh, Are we going down the right path or not? If that's your moral compass, 
maybe you need a little more training, you know, especially, and, and don't spring load to automatic labeling people and then shutting out honest opinion. Yeah. You know, for a, a group, believes in science. Science is science. The Bible is the Bible. They, they are what they are. How can man be <laughs> I read that. No, I tell people that you are the five people. I think it's a Jim Rohn thing, but you are the five people you hang around with, right? So in your case, you know, you were around those Vietnam vets who were smoking dope and drinking a lot, and you could have easily just stayed on that path. But instead, the five people you were around with most changed, not by your own volition, not by something that you did, just, you know, it happened, which was a grace from God at that point, right? But you were able to change the five people you were around that then changed the path you were going down. So you know, I tell people, if you're around a bunch of drug dealers, gangs, and thieves, you're going to become a drug dealer gang in a gang and be a thief. Like, that's just kind of the, how it goes. You put yourself around a bunch of, you know, if you make your peer group um, overachievers who are always striving to be better, you know, husbands, fathers, um, you know, people, business owners, like whatever it is, striving to do better, guess what you're going to do? Success. You're going to become that type of person. You know, that's why I joined masterminds. That's why we built a mastermind. That's why, you know, I coach people on these things is because if you're not doing that, if you're not putting yourself in the right room, you know, I tell people, I always want to be the dumbest and poorest person in every room I walk into. Like, you know, so it's one of the reasons I joined GoBundance. Like it allowed me to be the dumbest and poorest person in the room. I walk in there and I go, man, I'm around some really ridiculous people, but these are the people that's going to make me. To, uh, oh, well, we went to Austin. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, that was a fun trip. Yeah, father son golf trips. Highly recommend. That was our first like big father son golf trip, and it was fantastic. But yeah, it was you know it always trying to put myself around those people. So now I've talked about go abundance. There's a section of go abundance called fam abundance, which is about families and the way we do family masterminding. Where the family and I are actually getting ready to go here in a couple of weeks to a fam abundance event. We get a bunch of other entrepreneur dads together with their families and all the families now get to mastermind. They could build like, um, you know, family goal boards of where you want to be and like vision boards and all this stuff for your family to be able to stay focused and, you know, drive forward as a family. And one of the fan abundance events uh, that I went to, uh, they talked about, you know, we all in go abundance in one thing, I, you know, I always teach. And like, that's one of the reasons I help run the mastermind is we're always seeking coaches and mentors to help us get better. Are we being purposeful about seeking seeking coaches and mentors for our kids. And that's something that I would have never thought about had it not been for that. So it's one of those things like now as we're getting ready to move, I'm like, all right, I've been talking to Raquel. Um, hey, like, let's find Adam because Adam loves golfing, right? So you know, let's find Adam a good, solid coach that is great with kids that can be like his coach that can work him through these things and help him through all this stuff. And it could be a mentor for him and put the right people in his life that are going to help improve his golf game, his life, his ability to be able to talk with people, everything, right? Because like, once you have those good mentors, it's going to make you better. It's something I'm passionate about is, is, you know, being a dad and doing everything I can to make these kids, um, you know, the best kiddos I could be. So higher coach. Yeah, I don't, it's, you know, (laughs) and you're a very busy person. Anyways, jerk face. There's something about the relationship between a father and a son, right? that doesn't do well to me, it doesn't do well for coaching, right? It's great for being a mentor, being a dad, but something about sports stuff, there's like this weird thing, at least with me, right? I don't want it to, like, I feel like when he hears it come out of my mouth, he hears it as an authoritative figure telling me to do it and not like, hey, let me just help you do these things. Like, I want to be able to help him, but it doesn't always come out that way or, you know, he doesn't always feel it that way. So if, and I'm not, an expert in this, right? I can see what he's doing. I can see some things that need to be fixed. I can see how how things are getting uh, need to be tweaked. But when it comes down to it, I don't know how to teach him how to do any of that. Like, I've never been a teacher for golf, so I need to hire somebody that could do that. I don't know, you know. So if I could, you know, uh, as long as he's still willing to do it, still wants to do it, then I'll keep on letting him do it. But uh, uh, golf, as where does that sound? I really started picking up golf also, like eighty eighty one around Reagan's time, mm-hmm. and I had an old guy. He said, life is like golf. If you treat your family and respect golf and respect your family as much, you're going to be fine. Respect for the land, you know, the earth you're playing on. You don't litter. Honesty with keeping score. The ability to enjoy the fresh air as a family. You know, it's outside. It's, for me, forever, it was the opposite of work. You're working on the flight line, you're surrounded. You've been there, you're crew on airplanes. Yeah. It's loud, it's windy, it's 
hotter than hot, colder than cold. There's the pressures of launching airplanes, recovering airplanes. There's just so many things people don't take into consideration how much trouble is around you that you're always looking over your shoulder on the flight line. So those days off to go play golf, oh, it's great. And then you enjoy the airplanes when they're flying overhead because mm -hmm. they're always there because you're on bases, but you're just glad you're not working. You're not out there recovering it. You know, you're out here on the golf course. With your family. I brought you guys as often as we could. And the girls, not so much. You picked it up pretty quick. Yeah. You enjoy that's something that you and I've been doing since right after you can walk. Yeah. It's you know, play school or golf for them. Yep. You did the same with your sons. You know, yep. golf helps set that right. Prior to that, I was more of a reactive person. Not a proactive. I mean, father would be much be proactive. Yeah, for sure. I was years years behind the power curve before I could realize by the time I got we got to you raising you, we we're a lot smarter about raising kids. You know what they say, like the commercial, you know, the first one, you're oh, it's so precious, you're so cautious, <laughs> baby bath. Second one, you just hold them in the shower. <laughs> well, third one, go do it on your own. Yeah, figure it out, buddy. No wonder I always smelled bad. Jeez. By the time we got to you, we were all pretty well fine-tuned as parents, and we were pretty well grounded as a family. And we didn't visit mine much. Her mom's family, we visited them a lot. And I was always loved more from mom's family than my own. No, for sure. I remember the last time that I remember visiting your family. I used to always pet Pat uh, Howard, your stepdad, on the head before we leave. And I went over there one day and I pat him on the head. He said, you ever touch my head again, I'll break your arm. And that was pretty much the last time we ever went and visited. And so it's like, yeah, I don't need to be in there, you know. I don't, um, bother. I don't need to expose that to my Yeah. Kids. So it's those things. You've got to learn where your priorities are. My priority was with you. Yeah. Not with them. And mom took it well. My two brothers that were there, and their wife, they all knew. Right, wrong, or indifferent, Jim did the right thing. Yeah. And it just, you know, I never had to go back. I never did. Never went back to the house with you guys. You guys weren't yeah. close to any of that. Yep. It, was, it was bad. It was a lot of, honestly, you know, against the law, it was just no. Just a toxic place. Yeah. Toxic. That's a good Yeah, one. just a toxic place. I mean, everything from the language to the alcohol and the cigarettes and the, the treatment of people, the everything. It was just kind of a, a toxic environment. So it's like a barroom brawl every day. Yeah. And I'm glad you got to see some of it. Yeah. I'm glad that's all I saw. Right. So when you're, when your old man bets a game <clears throat> from high school, you know, I should be able to be a very good dad just by showing up. <laughs> you can't do just that. It takes a lot yeah. more than showing up. Hmm. My old man showed up, but never was there. Yeah. Dads are important. Yeah. Dads know that's the title. That's to me, that's the best title I ever had. I love being a grandpa. But as a dad, you've got that lump of clay. Mm -hmm. It's up to you to figure out which direction it's going to go. And I knew from my personal experience, I needed a new direction. And we were, mom and I, we were public servants. Payday to payday, and then you met the correct woman who changed your basis in yep. your future. You don't have to live payday to payday. Mm -hmm. It took me until I met Raquel to, wow, I got to put some money away for retirement. <laughs> yeah. And she gave me a number, and I doubled it in a year. So I said, you know, there is something to this. You really can buckle down and save the money. And yeah, you yeah. can work a little bit. I worked a lot of overtime to get to that point. Dream. Yep. Now you get to enjoy yourself. Yeah. You get to be a happy dad and happy grandpa. I've never been happier. And like I said, good, bad, or indifferent. We talked before. I don't think there is or isn't a perfect dad. But if there, if you're out there and you're involved, you'll know what course to take. Yeah. As long as you have a good moral compass, you'll know what course to take, and you will become that dad. It takes work. No one's going to give it to you, and you can't look inward in your family all the time. you got to look out. Yeah. you got to see the world to learn how to mold that clay. And it, it took the world of the Air Force to teach me anything from cultural foods to people to needs. You know, every culture is different, and that's important when you're raising kids. And I never realized how important until you guys grew up and 
graduated, went on your way. I look at the families and I say, we did good. We did good. Yes. My family looks down at their nieces and nephews and judges them for this. <laughs> I look at them saying, I love the steps they took. As a dad, yeah. I couldn't be more proud. Yeah, I've got no complaints. You know, I think that's the routes we all took, the things that we've done, the, play, the thing, like, I mean, what is there to complain about? You know, like there's no normal way just to be the, be the dad. Yeah. Just be involved. You can make mistakes and you're going to, we've just discussed them, but don't ever give up being a dad. Yeah. Don't ever give up patience. You know? And I'm more happy with myself now as a dad after retirement, because like you said, once you get rid of that stuff out, mm -hmm. get rid of the noise, you get to look back and say, here I am at this point. And I look back at the family and what you guys all created. I don't know if you got a good picture. Oh yeah. I can see every bit of it. Yeah. But my family and where it brought us, I kind of like the roots I've set down. I'm more proud now. I've always thought I did a good job, but now I think I'm pretty sure we did a good job. Yeah. I don't want to say I did a good job. I always say we did a good job. Oh, it's definitely a team. Yeah. Yep. And it's a tag team sometimes. Oh, very much so. Yeah. And you, know, it's, you I tell people in the military that divorce rate is ridiculous, right? And, I, and of course, I talk to a lot of dudes. And, uh, you know, tell people all the time, I'm like, you are going to impact your children. Regardless, no matter what you do, you're going to impact your children. Do you want to impact them and change their lives while standing next to them? Or do you want to do it from another state, from another country, while some other guy after your divorce is living in the house? Like, you're still going to be impacting your kids, but it's your choice, right? So, like, to me, it's so important to make sure that the relationship between me and Raquel stays super duper strong. Because if that doesn't stay strong, then the relationship with the kids is going to fall apart completely. Like it all is going to start from there. So if like the involvement of Raquel and everything and all of our, like, you know, we, we just went through a marriage course with a bunch of other couples and called marriage on the rock. And we're like, one of the things that somebody mentioned was like, anytime that we had a big decision, this is that, that person talking that we have a big decision, you know, or if there's a disagreement, then we'll put everything on pause. The kids will see the two of us go into the bedroom. We have a discussion ourselves. We come out as a unified couple to talk to the kids about what is going to happen because we get to an answer that we both agree on. Whether one person's thrilled about it or not, it doesn't matter. The kids never see the difference. They see that where there's a unified couple right here in front of them. Mom and dad are the same. It does not matter. They are going to have the same uh, thing. So we don't have the mom and dad thing going on and all the stuff. So I mean, like the importance of both couples, of both parents in the couple is immensely high. Like it's super important. Yeah, for sure. And too many people I see that would just kind of give up. But again, you know, military, the divorce rate is insane. So watching all of that happen constantly, it was one of those things again, where it was a reminder to me, like I saw all these broken kids and I'm like, there's no reason for that. Like I need to make sure that I take care of this, this relationship so that it's strong and we push forward together. Dads need to teach too is commitment. Yeah. Make sure, you know, is this the person for you? It's not, you know, the French or one night stand. You got to think. Wait, if that's French, I tell you what. <laughs> <laughs> you got to go with that one. It'd be the best. But yeah, you've got to take every decision as you do. You do as a dad is a direct reflection on your kids. Yeah, they see it all. You know that step that caused a divorce, or. <laughs> You decide to take a job or become a trucker, even, you know, being away. Like when I was away at Sing Sing for two years, that affected it. We weren't really separated, but yet we were separated. Yeah. I was always on the road, always gone. Coming, it was always a rush. You know, the paychecks were nice, but it was sacrifice that I had to make. Yeah. You guys didn't see it at first, but now you look back and say, you know, like you were TDY, you know, and it's had to be made. Yeah. So there are sacrifices out there. Um, you got to make a commitment. You got to remember the, I can't tell you the, the, the exact names, can't get the counselors, put a of my marriage. But the decision making is one of them. You can't have one person making decisions without involving the other. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, that particular pillar of the foundation of the marriage that goes up to the children instead of down goes up. You got to support the children. It weakens everything. So the decisions have to be made together and it makes you both better mom and dad. For sure. And it your children, it shows continuity. And that's a great message to send the kids. You know, they're all on the same page.
the learning curve is coming from both of them. So I guess they're right. Mm-hmm. Not be right. It only depends on the learning curve. You know, yeah. on the parents, but you guys are well molded. And your sons, you can tell by the way they're starting already, um, the amount of respect they have for you guys and one another and other people. That's a great moral compass to start. Yeah. So not that they're going to be fine if you walked out tomorrow. You don't. <laughs> no, they would not be. Yeah. You're on the right track as a dad. You know, you're amazing that with everything that you have done, and, and just so people know, Adam and didn't Adam and Raquel didn't really tell mom and dad, yeah, I want to get into financing and do this, that, and the other thing. My first exposure to that was, hey, Adam wrote a book. <laughs> 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 wow, ADPI, what what? And I didn't know you were taking that track. And then we had a visit. Uh, we talked about it, and it's nice having a hands off and watching you take that track. You're off the paycheck to paycheck that we were on. My family, they didn't have paychecks. They were waiting for their welfare check. Mm -hmm. So if you get a job, you get paid twice. (laughs) And so, yeah, you're doing exactly what I thought I was doing the right way, except you're doing it on steroids. It's a different culture now. Oh, a different world completely. And I had a different example, right? So, yeah. I'm thinking you had a much better example than I had. I yeah, I, I think so. Yeah, I think so. As a father figure, Tony the Tiger was. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you have some more props. I'm going to change that over a little bit. You said you have multiple props. What do we have here? I brought. I'm interested. This is the first one you've saw it briefly. I don't know if you can read that. Yeah, yep. Yeah, the very first hole in one. My first hole in one. Yeah. yeah, with my son, and I brought that up because. That was probably, with all the pressures in life, you know, going on back then, I was working at Corrections, working 16-hour shifts. That took more of a load off my shoulder, getting that hug from you. You did it. You did it. You know, and we did it together. And I I think we talked about it. If I get a hole in one, I'd want my first one to be with you. Mm -hmm. And it was, you swear it didn't go down that way, but. I don't remember you saying, please don't die. <laughs> I made a comment about, you know, a hole in one and the Patriots won the Super Bowl the same year. That would be my life. You know, that would make me just the happiest guy on earth because I survived the 85 Super Bowl. And my son gave me this. Up a little higher. Can't see it. 80, 85 Patriots. There we go. Yeah. 1985 New England Patriots. You know what my son said to me about this? Don't hawk it because he wants to inherit it. It's the only reason I gave it to you. But I know it's coming back. So eventually it'll come back to me. So because I've got the magic helmet. Uh yes, you do autographed helmets. Yep. Like this is something I didn't have in my life going with my dad. Sports. I'm glad I had football because we rooted for the Patriots and they just stuck forever. Speaking of Patriots and boys, come here, dude. Oh. You come say hi to grandpa. Oh, hi, bud. Let me hi, see. Papa. What happened to that second tooth? How did what? It come out? What happened to your tooth? I lost them. You lost <laughs> them. Oh, you sound funny. You got a nice <laughs> smile. Yeah, I call them toothless now. <laughs> uh, they're going to grow back very fast. Oh, yes. How did you take that second one out? We used a slingshot. Yeah, we tied the dental floss to a golf ball, and then I shot the golf ball with a slingshot. Well, I tied the other end of the dental floss to his tooth, and I shot the golf ball with a slingshot, and out comes the tooth. But it was the fifth time. It took five times, yeah. It kept sliding five off his times. tooth. That one didn't want to come out. No, it kept sliding off his tooth. We couldn't get it to grip well. It was super sharp. Mm-hmm. It broke the... Uh, Your dad's out there. This dad comes up with unique ways to pull teeth. <laughs> Whether it's a remote control car, basketball, or mm-hmm. a Nerf gun. That tooth is coming out, and they're going to have fun with it. You're hiding your face, but Oh, no, it's the mic. It's the microphone, yeah. How was right. today, buddy? Grandpa said, how was school today? It was good. I'm glad. Can you hear me okay? Yep. I love you. Tell your brother what? I love you. Okay. And I love you. <laughs> and say hi to Grandma for Grandpa. Okay. And with you guys, huh? 
Yep, grandma's up here hanging out. Bye. All right, you're going to go have fun. Love you, dude. And that be Adam. Yep, and that is Adam, the oldest. Adam is Adam. He's out there. Peepaw says hi. <laughs> uh, what else you got back there? Fun times, father, son. It's really important to get out. Oh, yes. TPC Sawgrass. That was a good time. Adam took me to mm-hmm. TPC Sawgrass. We played the die course. And uh, how much fun it was and how difficult it was. Mm-hmm. That, those greens. Or the golf is something else. Yeah, those greens were like at 12 and a half. Stint meter. It was, I mean, uh, in Austin, those greens were ridiculous too. Holy gracious. Oh, I said something before the show started. Mm-hmm. Uh, you are interrupting the PGA, by the way. Oh, yeah. What, what the? Yeah. And they had the best three, the best three golfers on the planet play the first mm-hmm. hole together. Tiger Woods, Jordan Spieth, Rory McIlroy. That was the first three from that went off. That's impressive. Yeah, Rory did good. Tiger, not so much. I didn't hear a thing about speed. Tiger wasn't playing as best, and Rory was lighting it up. Nice. That's impressive. Yeah, the PGA is this weekend. Well, I guess we're going to have to watch it. So, What else do I got back there? Oh, yeah. A proud father. This is the keys to my car. My other car is a hybrid, my golf cart. <laughs> we moved before flight. You've seen a few of those. Oh, uh, yes. It's kind of beat up. Oh, yeah. Adam was the airman of the year. And as a father, mm-hmm. his father, I made airman of the month a couple of times, well, probably mm-hmm. half a dozen. An airman of the quarter and a nominee for airman of the year, which and that was just for my base, but you made it all the way through the base. As well as the command. Remember that for soon. So again, it goes back to being a dad. Just by being a good dad, it made me a better sergeant. Because the compass works both ways in, in your home life and your work life. Your work life is good, your home life is good. And you took it all and managed to succeed across the board. I'd let you know nobody gets to see you in your uniform. But I love to see you in your uniform because, like, they teach you, you know, all the fruit salad, everything that mm-hmm. says something about you and your experiences. My little experience, you know, four or five rows, and you got eight or nine rows. <laughs> it's kind of neat. It's kind of neat that as a dad, you followed the same route I did. And you took it right up until you didn't need it anymore. And now you're branching out and doing something. Totally different that I never saw coming. Yeah, no kidding, right? And now you're a pilot, you're a real estate guy, you are a golfer, you're a great father. Now, besides being a pilot and a real estate investment, you know, the same mold, which you you've taken different ventures that you could afford and have the time for. Whereas when I was your age and your kids were the same age. That I had to work three jobs just to mm-hmm. so I was away a lot of little. Uh no. And I was never exposed to anybody that tells me and there's yeah, that's one of the reasons that we run ADPI, the active duty passive income community, is the military is not gonna help you do it by you know teaching you how to do that. They may talk to you about doing the TSP, you know, your thrift savings plan, but they're not going to try to help you get rich. They're not going to try to help you be more successful. They're not going to try to help you build a portfolio. They're not going to do any of that stuff. It's just, it's not in their interest to do that. Right. So if we could teach somebody how to use their VA loan at each one of their assignments to buy an investment property. Um, yes, it's going to be something that you're living in during that assignment. But if you buy duplex, triplex, quadplex, do the house hacking type thing with your VA loan, you could set yourself up by the time you retire with, you know, you've got seven duplexes, you know, like that's, 14 doors paying you money every month like that you've set yourself up for. And that's would have never crossed my mind when, you know, I first joined the military, the first 10 years I was in the military would have never crossed my mind. And then finding folks like Raquel and then ADPI, I mean, it was one of those, you know, eye opening things changed my trajectory for sure. And as you know, dads have a lot of pressure and about what's going on in their life. Can they actually do this? You put together a good team, whereas you weren't in it by yourself. Yeah. And then that team, Led you to where you're at today. Now your team has roots going out into like three different companies, four. Yeah. 
coaching company, RAL. I wore that shirt today, by the way. <laughs> nice. I had to take a shower after golf. And at ADPI, you've got players and lots of little players, and I love yep. it. And you've got that weight on a GI's pay. So helping another GI, that's what GIs do. Yeah. It's amazing how we, nobody ever came up with any of that when I was your age. Because, they, like you said, they didn't teach it. You just had to have an entrepreneur who was the GI. If you happen to cross paths with one, that's about it. Recruiting school. That's when I, I first heard the word networking, you know, and I, I was in sales as a kid. I mean, I sold burpee seeds and newspapers and sold myself, you know, the Catholic school trying to make money for Catholic school. Recruiting came easy, but I never heard the term networking, reaching mm-hmm. out to other people. And then with them other people, especially if they're dads, like all the dads I met at that other something out in Austin. I've never been in a circle of so many like-minded people that I respect and like immediately. And then when it was all done, here we are, these strangers, you know, waves of emails from all these guys saying, you know, welcome back. The five best people you hang around with are what you are. You're right. These are the guys that I've never been exposed to. And now you're exposed to hundreds of them. I've only seen this one little group. Yeah, you're well in your way. So are your kids. And That's how you got to do it. You got to change your environment. Change your environment and be willing. Not necessarily take risk. You know, it's calculated risk. Calculated risk. Yeah. But don't be afraid to jump. Yeah. You never know what's around that next door. You, know, you never do. And it's amazing. You guys have done so well. And you as an entrepreneur, it's totally shocked everybody in my family. Yeah, and my friends, you know, the five favorite, the five friends I used to hang out with, you know, drunk COs and <laughs> cops and firefighters, <laughs> which are out of my loop. I don't, I even, I don't really drink at all down here. Yeah, you know, I did a couple of times early, but now the my guys that I hang out with, there's not a bum in the bunch of them. There's no arguing. There's no real attitudes. That changes your perspective. It's another reason you're so happy. Like it's really happy. Yeah. I weed it off. Not so much bad habits, but we did off those things that, that take more than give. I mean, now I have more room for giving than taking. You know, it's, yeah, pretty really happy. I'm a very happy dad and a very happy granddad. And it's nice to see my son become the dad of you. Especially with what I have to do. <laughs> if not him. Yeah. Did I do a good job? Did I do a bad? I don't know. The jury's still out. But I think I did. I think the jury's back in. I think we're good. You did well, Pops. But on that note, I don't know. We've been talking for probably an hour. You know, for those people that are listening, I can't uh, express it enough. Dad is like the most important title a male human being can have on this earth. Because your scope of influence is beyond your reach. And what you do and say, you don't know what it's going to hit. But there's going to be something that your son's going to come back and remember. And it's going to help him make a decision that it's the right one, not the wrong one. And it's going to impact their kids and their kids' kids. It's like, this is a generational thing we do. I am looking so, I am so comfortable with my children's futures. That's something I don't have to worry about. Leaving my family name is no longer, it's more of an honor than the, me being the youngest of five older brothers. Uh, yeah, I didn't, I got looked at funny because of my older brother's reputations. Mm-hmm. I like the way my reputation settled now and even better for my son and my grandson. Awesome. Well, thank you. You're quite welcome, son. Quite welcome. I know it's not radio else backpacking, but you know, <laughs> you've got to re- reward good fatherhood too, because there are rewards there. You take them and they'll continue to come as long as you continue to be a dad. They never stop coming. Dad- it is uh, a constant reward system watching this. I tell you what, it's, um, uh, and, it, you know, I tell Adam, just, I mean, he's only three. He's a little young to really have the deep conversations, right? But I tell Adam all the time, I'm like, I've never been a dad to a seven to three-year-old. So I'm learning how to be a dad to a seven to three-year-old. You're learning how to be a big brother to a three-year-old. You're learning how to be a seven-year-old. Let's do this together. Let's learn how to do it together. Let's get better. Let's always, you know, again, we're going to fail, but let's fail forward learn from what we're doing and, and press forward. And um, it's all we can do. Just keep on, keep on learning, keep on getting better. 
And that's the point of what these types of conversations are supposed to do is to help, you know, even if somebody listening they took just maybe one nugget of our conversation and went, wow, I should really apply that to my life. Then, then our, our conversation was well worth it. If for nothing else, it was well worth it for us to just chat. So, um, you know, that's why I told, I've told a few people, cause I've got a list of, of, uh, of people that already want to, want to do this, uh, do this show. So, um, I told them if nothing else, this podcast is really for me to just steal everybody else's good ideas and then <laughs> that I could apply them in my life. So if somebody else gets it, Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and that's what I'm looking forward to is just constantly learning, constantly growing and, and getting better. Yeah, you interview Musk or Trump, make sure I'm in on it. All right. I'll, I'll do that. Yeah. All right. I introduce you to some pretty cool people. Your first uh, that exposes us to a few cool things. Been around a few cool things in my day. So yeah, Woodstock. Woodstock was an interesting time. It was a fun time. <laughs> that was fun. Yeah, it was a good time. We'll talk about that on another show. Uh, perhaps on another show, yes. All right. Well, thank you so much, Dad, for jumping on. And, um, you know, it, it, <laughs> for those listening, it was comical because Dad had said, uh, you sent this Zoom link. I don't even know what Zoom is. What What is this? Is anything, okay, we well, could do this to set it up. And um, and they go, oh, okay. And then we, we get on it and I can't get the audio to work. We can't get the thing to go on. So it was, it was a good time getting it set up. Um, so for those of you who know how technically challenged I am, I got it from my dad. My wireframe is already set. <laughs> well, <the tech> did <laughs> so, oh, of course not. Yeah. But it just didn't exist. I mean, you guys learned it, whereas us were thrust into it. Wait a minute. You guys all learned in school, it didn't even exist when I was in school. Yeah. You know, we had DOS, we had DOS and TRS eighty, Radio Shack. Yeah, top of the line back then. Radio. That's funny. And you type in words, and just it was all words. It was all in your head. Yep. Wow. Of course. Never heard of it. Moves at the speed of light. Technology just it's impressive. The first one, Zoom. Here we are. Well, I'm glad to have popped your Zoom, Cherry. Do it again. So, all right, Pops. Well, thank you very much. I got the little man knocking on the door again, wanting, I'm assuming, me to go eat dinner. So I'm going to go eat dinner. Thank you so much. I appreciate you sharing mom with me as she's up here helping us pack and get ready to move. So I help take care of the kids and run around. So I appreciate that. I'm sure you're enjoying more and more golf as that, uh, as that goes. So, um, but. All right. Well, I love you very much, Pops. It was a pleasure having you as the first guest here. I thank you so much and uh, look forward to many more of these types of interviews. I hope this was a great success. And I hope some dads, like you said, even take one little piece of information that would better them. That's what the conversation is about. And you can't ever learn unless you're in a conversation. Yeah. And that's one of the first things. Communicate with your kid. Communicate with your kid. You know, that's my best advice. Don't fall for it. Extremely important. Love you too, Pops. Good luck. Love to your man. <laughs> Will do. All righty. Thanks, everybody. See you on the next one.